All right, if you guys don't mind, we're gonna stand for the reading of the word. We're gonna go to Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. That's right, whip out those iPhones. Or if you have an actual Bible, there you go, Andrew. I love that. The youth pastor has his phone. That's great. <laughs> All right, you guys, here we go. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Hey, today we're going to talk about maturity. Got any mature people in this place? Hey, why don't we go ahead and uh, let's pray before we... Have a seat. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us here together to have fun, to meet friends, to hang out with friends, and most importantly, to encounter you. We just thank you that your presence is here, Lord, and it's your presence that changes our life. It's your presence that changes this world. And so, God, we're just inviting you and your presence to continue to move in and among us as we look at your word in these next few moments. Lord, I pray for healing in people's lives today. Lord, I pray for emotional healing. I pray for a physical healing. I pray for a spiritual healing. Lord, if those uh, are here that have never said yes to you, Lord, I pray that today would be a day they find life and hope in you, Lord, and then they would go public with their faith and get baptized afterwards in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Hey, next Sunday is a big Sunday, guys. Big Sunday, we have uh, one service only for one last Sunday, then we're going back to two services, 9 and 1045, and all the 9 a.m. people are so thankful for that. <laughs> they are super thankful for that. Vision night is going to be great. We're going to share some things that are going to be brand new that you're not going to want to miss. I really want you to be there to, uh, Vision night, Sunday night, next Sunday. So it's going to be a big Sunday. And i got some things I'm going to introduce and talk about. If this place is your home, you're wanting to make this place your home, please be there Sunday night next week. And there's one thing I will mention. I won't mention why. I'll talk about why next Sunday night. But I'd love you, for you to put this on your calendar. Saturday, March 26th, the last Saturday of, of March next month, so it's about a month away, we're going to do a work party right here. And so just want to invite you to come and just work, put on your, your work clothes, and we're going to show up, and, and I'll tell you why we're going to do it that Saturday, next Sunday night. But just want to get that on your calendar. Saturday, March 26th, work party. We'd love to have you to come and just help, and we're just going to party, and we're going to, we're going to do some work here at the church. So hey, let's talk about this passage here in Hebrews 5. I really love this passage. It talks about the importance of you and I growing in maturity. It's actually kind of hilarious. It, talk, you know, it talks about being a baby. Don't be a, a, a baby, but you need to grow up and be an adult. And like we've talked about in this series called Emotional Health, Raising Your EQ, we've talked about we can be 50, 60 years old, but still emotionally be a baby or a child or an adolescent. The goal is that we grow into emotional adulthood. That's the goal. And so I just love the imagery and the words of this Hebrews 5 passage. It's like, it's time some of us grow up. Come on, tell your neighbor next to you, come on, say, grow up, okay? <laughs> grow up. In the version we read there, verse 11 says, says, some of you are slow to learn. Okay, you can stop telling them that, okay? You don't need to talk anymore, okay? Come on. No details. Uh, slow to learn was what Vanessa read. I let the NLT, the New Living says this, says some of you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. And I pray that wouldn't describe any of us. Spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. It's like we hear it, but we don't really hear it because we don't live it out. And today I got a message that I don't want you just to hear. I want you to live this out. Like I've heard a lot of feedback in this series on emotional health. More than most series. It's up there with the Apocalypse Revelation series, which, by the way, we're going back to Apocalypse, season two, yeah. next Sunday. 
So we're back into a journey through Revelation. It's going to be a fun, special Sunday as we kick it off, season two. And so a lot of people have been talking about this has been very beneficial, very helpful. We've gone deep underneath the surface, exploring some things in our life that we need to deal with and that we can deal with with God's help. Amen. Thankfully. And here's the good news. God loves you no matter what. He loves you right where you're at. But he loves you so much, he wants you to grow. He wants you to grow in maturity emotionally and spiritually. And one of the premises of this whole series is that it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. It's a Pete Scazzaro quote from the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality stuff. So we want to grow spiritually and emotionally. And I love verse 14 gives us a good definition of maturity. As we talk about emotional health, we're talking about emotional maturity. That's what we're talking about. It's emotional intelligence. And so it says, by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Constant use, train yourself. We're in a process of training ourselves with the partner uh, of the Holy Spirit who is alive and at work inside of us. We can train ourselves to grow in maturity. That's the goal. To train yourself. But we're not trying to grow. We're training ourselves to grow. We're not trying to just deal with baggage and issues in our life on the inside. We're training ourselves and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us from the inside out as we do some practices that are going to help us and allow the Holy Spirit to move in and through us in our life. I got a, a, a golf club back here in my little prop section back here. Anybody still digging ditches? Oh. <laughs> Anybody like golf? Any, any golf fans out there? I know I've got a few of you guys that are, that are way better at golf than I am here. Uh, I love golf. It's, it's a fun sport. And something about golf where you just go and you hang out with friends on the golf course, it's, it's just fun, it's a cool place. You know, but golf's an interesting sport in and of itself. In one hole, you can feel like you're Tiger Woods. In the next hole, you can feel like you're the worst golfer on planet Earth. That's golf. You can feel like, I'm doing pretty, I'm actually getting the hang of this. No, I'm not. I forgot everything that I thought I knew about golf, you know. And so I've been golfing for over 30 years now. I love golf. And you might think, well, golfing for 30 years, Tyrone must be pretty good, right? No, you'd be wrong. <laughs> See, I've been golfing for over 30 years, but what I haven't been doing is training myself. I haven't been practicing the art of golf. And so when I go out there, I struggle. And I don't play as good as like I used to in years past when I used to train myself and practice. It's the same in our spiritual and our emotional life. You want to grow. You, you, it's not about trying. It's about training yourself. Training yourself. Having practices in your life that are going to help you grow. And I want to give you some very good practical things today. Today's going to be one of those messages that at the end of it, you're not going to be like, wow, that was amazing. No, this is going to be one of those messages that you're going to be like, okay, I got to go live this thing out. And my job is to equip you. I want to equip you to get as close to Jesus as you possibly can and to allow him to move and work in your life. And I want to give you some things. I would encourage you to take some notes today because it's very practical and practices that if you want to become a good golfer, I'm going to give you some good practices and, and tips on being a, a good golfer today. Anybody want that? Anybody need that? Okay, I'd be the wrong guy to give you that, actually. But to train yourself to grow in emotional health and emotional maturity. You ready for this? Let me give you the, the definition that we gave the first week of emotional intelligence. This is what emotional intelligence is. It's your ability to recognize and understand emotions and your skill at using this awareness to manage yourself and your relationship with others. That's what it means to be emotionally intelligent or healthy. And so I'm able to discover what's going on inside of me, and then I use that information to actually manage how I live my life. Everything that I go through, I'm able to manage myself emotionally and, and the, the relationships around me. And as we grow in that, we grow in maturity. So the first week, we talked about the first step to growing in emotional health, and it is self-awareness. I've got to grow in self-awareness, which is right there in the definition there. And I gave you two reflection questions that I want to give you again because I think these are so important for us. If we're going to allow God to move and work and transform us from the inside out, here's two reflection questions. How am I feeling right now, and why do I feel this way? 
This is inviting the spirit to go beneath the surface of your life, into your, your soul, and really help him, allow him to help you process what's going on inside of me. And here's the deal. A lot of us are struggling because we are unaware of what's going on inside of us. So Holy Spirit wants to help you with that, Psalm 139. How am I feeling right now? Why do I feel this way? Okay, week two, we talked about how to resolve conflict in an emotionally healthy way. If you were here, you remember this. Maybe you listened to it online. Uh, but we talked about the difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. Big difference. And how God has anointed you. He has commissioned all of you to be ministers of reconciliation. That's the ministry he has given every single one of us as his followers, as his believers. Last week, we talked about how our family dynamics impact us. And how to be emotionally healthy, we've got to go back, oftentimes in order to go forward. I've got to deal with this process, this allow God to heal so I can go forward. We just, sometimes we just can't keep moving forward and treasure along. We've got to go back and, and process and work through things and allow God to bring healing to our life in order to move forward. And the good news is that Jesus can set you free. And that's what we talked about last week. Jesus can set you free from the patterns and the pain of your past. I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful that he loves us and he wants to set us free from the junk. And he's got an amazing future for us. And some of you today, maybe it's a day to say yes to the future that Jesus has for you. He has the power to set you free from the patterns and the pain of your past. And so today we're going to talk about some practices to grow in emotional health. I'm going to give you kind of three overarching things, but there's going to be lots of little things within there. But practices to grow in emotional health. Number one, I want to talk about Sabbath and rest. Sabbath and rest. It's pretty obvious. We live in a very fast-paced, hurry-up, busy, 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 busy culture, right? Like life just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And, and, and here's, the, here's what we need to do. We need to learn to slow down. You hear us talk about this quite often here at Rivers Church. Slow down. Down. In fact, I love this quote from, from Dallas Willard. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. It's so important that we learn how to do that. We've got to slow down. Life just is go, 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 go. And we don't take time to stop and rest and be with God and enjoy God and let him do a work inside of us. See, here's the deal, guys. As followers of Jesus, we are citizens of a different kingdom. We don't live according to the principles and the values of the kingdom of this world anymore. We are now a part of the kingdom of God as his followers. And the values in the kingdom of God are different than the kingdom of this world. And so it's important we understand what, what values am I chasing? What am I going after? Like we have a, a culture that's just exhausted and worn out. And I think it's because we're going after the wrong values. And so as, as kingdom people, as kingdom-minded, kingdom-focused, kingdom-first people, we are chasing after the values of Jesus and, and his kingdom. We are called to live different. We're called to love different. We are counterculture in how we're... So we're not called to emulate the world and to live like them and to chase after the... Like, the values of this world leave us feeling empty and, and unfulfilled and just broken and like, is this it? Yeah. And so that's why we go to, well, have to go after the values of the kingdom of God. Because only in him can we find that purpose and that hope and that fulfillment. And so a lot of people are just stressed out, they're anxious, and it's really because we're, we value the wrong things. We're pursuing the wrong things. We actually have centered our life around values that we shouldn't center our life around. And here's, here's what Jesus says to the world. Like He offers this invitation to the world, which is in stark contrast to what the world is experiencing right now. Because we've got an anxiety epidemic going on right now. And Jesus calls us to this. He offers this. He invites us to this. He says, are you weary? Are you tired? Come to me. And I have rest. I have rest for you. Matthew 11. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And the next verse, he goes on. He's talking, take my yoke upon you. I, uh, my burden is light. 
I have rest for your souls. That's what we're talking about when we talk about emotional health is your soul. How's your soul? How you doing on the inside? Do you need rest? Does rest sound good right about now? I'm not talking just a physical rest. I'm talking about an inner rest for your soul. That's what Jesus offers us, a rest for our soul. And that's what Sabbath is. Sabbath literally is this. It is a... Here's, here's a definition of, of Sabbath, if I can find it. it it's meant to, uh, for us to experience rest and enjoyment in God. That's what Sabbath is. Experience rest and enjoyment in God. In a world that's so busy, that's worn out, that's stressed, that's anxious, this is what we need more of. Rest and enjoyment of God. <laughs> you know, work is a gift from God, right? But work is not to become God to us. That's what Sabbath breaks in our life. It helps us to remind us who God is. And so when we practice this, this rhythm uh, of Sabbath, we're reminded that he's in control, I can trust him, and that also I can enjoy him in that as well. You know what's interesting is every night we are forced to do something that many of us would choose not to do if we were given a choice. And that's called sleep. Anybody feel like I need more time in the day to get more stuff done and I got all this stuff? You know, it's like, okay, like, wouldn't it be nice if my body did not require sleep? Isn't it amazing that God designed you and I in such a way that we are forced into a rhythm where we have to have sleep? And as we lay down on our bed every single night for hours, hours, just laying there, we're doing nothing. We're just laying there. Isn't it interesting that life just goes on without us? Like the world keeps spinning. And it's just another reminder that I am not God. The world does not revolve. Like the world is not waiting for Tyrone to wake up. Okay, he's awake. Now we can get on with life again. Life goes on. It keeps happening and reminds us that God is in control. God designed our bodies in such a way that we are forced into a rhythm where we've got to lay down and rest, and we get, our body gets rejuvenated and energized as we do that, and we're ready to go about the next day. But God put that rhythm into our life, to, and I think it's part of it is to remind us that He is God, and we are not. And so Sabbath is the same thing. It's, a, it's us imitating God so we can stop trying to be like God. Or be God. God rested on the seventh day of creation, and he's given us this principle as a gift. This is a gift that you and I can, can utilize. It can be a, a 24-hour period any time of the week. I recommend 24 hours. Some people are just like, I, I absolutely cannot do that. It is physically, it's impossible. And maybe that might be true for your season of life right now. And I get that. So maybe try to do 12 hours. The thing about a Sabbath is you don't need to be legalistic about it. It's not a legalistic thing at all. It has to be this day and all this, and if you're not doing it like, like, like this and like I do it, then you're a sinner. No, 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 no. Sabbath is all about rest and enjoying God. Yeah. Whenever you want to do that, do that. But I would encourage you to practice the principle of Sabbath. Rest and Sabbath. You want to grow in emotional health, you practice this. This is something that is a part of the kingdom of God. It's not a kingdom of this world. It's part of the kingdom of God. And you practice this, Sabbath and rest. And if you want to study this more, go deeper into this, I highly recommend this book. It's called The Rest of God by Mark Buchanan. Phenomenal book that will minister to you, that will speak to you and talk about you know, the theological reasons and implications and just the practical things. It's a very, very good book, but... If we're going to grow in emotional health, we need Sabbath and rest as a part of the rhythm of our life, guys. And the thing I really want to encourage us today is this, is that we're, we're going to develop rhythms in our life that are centered on Jesus. Yes. Rhythms in our life that are centered not on me and my schedule, my busyness and all my work, or whatever, my family, my kids. It's centered on my, my marriage. No, no, no. We center it on Jesus. And the reason that we are unhealthy emotionally is because we have our life centered on the wrong things. Amen. And so I want to encourage you to develop rhythms in your life centered on Jesus. All right? 
It's a, uh, probably my favorite saying in all of life. It's one of my life mantras. And that is, who you are is more important than what you do. You know, what you do is important, guys. You are created to do, to do good works that God prepared for you in advance before you were even born. We were called to do good things, great things for God, for his kingdom. Um, but who you are is more important than what you do. And the reason for that is this. is because what you do flows out of who you are. Who you are is going to determine the effect and the impact of what you do. Who you are is more important than what you do. And so that's why I really value this emotional health stuff, because this is soul care. This is you and I taking care of who we are and making sure that we're not neglecting ourselves and our character and growing our relationship with God. Here's the deal. We're so busy doing. We, we, we're, we, we put a priority on doing that we stop being. And so this is you and I making sure that we be before we do. We want to be before we do. So ask this question. Does my current lifestyle and habits place Jesus at the center of my life? Emotional health will come from a rhythm of life that is centered on Jesus. And this is my challenge for you today. Center your life around him and let everything else fall into place from there. Sabbath and rest. Number two is this, practicing the presence. Oh, guys, we sang about it. We've worshiped. We've, we've declared it today. We need the presence of God. I'm convinced more and more and more and more, the older I get, the more I realize we need his presence in our life. As followers of Jesus, something amazing happens at that moment of salvation. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit, but the question is, does the Holy Spirit have us? Does the Holy Spirit have me? And so I want to encourage us to grow in this art, this what I call practicing the presence of God. So I, there's a few things within this that I want to give you. One of them is silence and solitude. And this is like a foreign concept to too many people these days. <laughs> Silence and solitude. Some of you, the moment you even think about that, you get a nervous twitch. Like, I got to sit and do nothing, you know? I was like, for five minutes? I can't sit and do nothing for five minutes. Like, I, I think I heard a, a notification on my phone. And it's, and <laughs> what do they call that? Phantom, phantom ringing, phantom notifications, all that. Like, you, we are so accustomed to our phone just beckoning us all day long, and we feel like it happens, and then we check our phone like it didn't happen. Because we've trained ourselves unconsciously, subconsciously to think that it's always happening. It's this fascinating thing that happens to us. And so silence and solitude. Do you have a place that you can go and you can just do nothing and be still and do what the psalmist says, be still and know that I am God? Do you have a place that you can go to, a time and a place that's free from distraction where you can enjoy the presence of God? You and I need silence and solitude. I'm talking about values in the kingdom of God again, guys. Silence and solitude is so important. I would encourage you every single day, take at least five minutes and just stop and sit. Take some long, deep breaths and enjoy God. Just relax in him. Enjoy his presence. Maybe even practice this thing called, this is part of the emotionally healthy spirituality stuff. It's called the daily office. And I love this, the daily office. It's several times a day, you take five to 15 minutes and you just stop. And here's the goal of the daily office, to be with God. <laughs> That's the goal. You don't have to read a bunch of scripture. You don't have to memorize anything. You don't have to pray a certain prayer. You don't have to be eloquent in your prayers. Just be with God. That's all you gotta do. Now, maybe you might go to scripture and read it for a little bit and meditate on it and think about it, pray it. Maybe you just want, want to put on some worship music and just enjoy the presence of God, but take five to 15 minutes several times a day. This is, this is how you and I can center our life and our heart and our soul back on Jesus because we can be all over the place. And so this little daily office thing becomes this moment where I just anchor myself in Jesus again. Remember in the prayer series last month, we talked about prayer is the most important work of your life. It's, it's the most important work of any work that you do, which is all good, but prayer is it. So that's why it's called the daily office. 
Silence and solitude, you and Jesus. I love what Dallas Willard said about this. He said, silence is frightening because it strips us as nothing else does. Throwing us upon the stark realities of our life, it reminds us of death, which will cut us off from this world and leave only us and God. And I think that's why God wants us to practice this. I think that's why it's important. And some of you, you feel that even as we read those words. (laughs) I really believe that we aren't as close to Jesus as we could be because we don't take the time to just stop and be with him and seek his presence and enjoy his presence and, and just listen and let him minister to us. See, this is an opportunity for you and I to experience the rest that Jesus offers us. And we're like, oh, that's a great scripture. Yeah, Jesus offers rest. Man, I sure wish I could experience some of that, though, Jesus. Where's the rest? And Jesus is like, come to me and just sit and wait and just be with me. And be still. And I have rest. Not just physical rest, but rest for your soul. Hmm. So this is all about practicing the presence of God, right? And so this comes from a very, very old book. It's a classic in Christian literature called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, a bunch of journals that him and a guy exchanged, uh, journal entries. And this is what he said in The Practice of the Presence of God. I highly recommend it, even though it's old English and sometimes difficult to understand. It's super good. And he says this. He says, The most holy and important practice in the spiritual life is the presence of God. That is, every moment to take great pleasure that God is with you. That means finding constant pleasure in his divine company speaking humbly and lovingly with him in all seasons at every moment without limiting the conversation in any way. There's no greater lifestyle and no greater happiness than that of having a continual conversation with God. It's practicing the presence. I think this is what Jesus meant when he talked in John 15 about you and I abiding with him, remaining in him. John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Which is kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? Like, apart from Jesus, I can do nothing? Like, seriously? Because if you stop and think about it, there's a lot of people that don't even believe in Jesus. And they're doing something. Like, I see a lot of famous, successful, rich, wealthy people that apart from Jesus, they're doing something. So why would Jesus say, apart from me, you can do nothing? What does he really mean by that? And I think he's referring to nothing that really matters. Apart from me, you can do nothing of kingdom significance. You can do nothing of eternal value if you don't remain in me and are connected to me. You and I can do nothing that impacts people and ourselves and the world uh, eternally unless we are connected to him. Stay connected to him. It, we're remaining in him. So that's the next little point of this whole practice in the presence is we're just remaining in Jesus constantly. What does that mean? How do we do this? It's just spending time with him. Maybe you could just, you devour this book. Take some time just to read that book, what, you know, as often as you can. You're just learning to hear his voice. You're just spending time with him, enjoying his presence That's remaining in him. It's learning to be aware of his presence alive and at work in your life throughout the day, throughout the busyness of your day. You and I can grow in awareness of him. And there's moments throughout the day that God wants to speak to you. He wants to prompt you. He wants to redirect you. He wants to fill you and anoint you. And he wants to empower you to do something of eternal significance, no matter where you're at. And so it's it's remaining in him. And... Uh, this, this means, I think, what we do is we really focus in on living by the Spirit. We want to be people who are filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, full of the power of the Spirit, as we've talked about so often here. Uh, live by the Spirit. Galatians 5.16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And so we can go to those places of the sinful nature of the flesh, and it's, it's, it's sin, and sin only brings death and destruction. And so we want to live by the Spirit, so we can experience the life that Jesus 
offers us and has for us through his spirit. So what does it mean to live by the spirit? It simply means I let the spirit lead me in every area of my life. That's what it means. When I live by the spirit, he is leading me in every area of my life, in my relationships, in my decisions about relationships. Is the spirit leading me in how I handle my family, in how I handle my job and how I work in my job? Is the spirit leading me in how I manage and handle my finances? Is the spirit leading me? Is he leading me in every area of my life? He wants to, he needs to, and when you and I live this way, it goes far better than if we live by ourselves and live according to the flesh. Live by the Spirit. And so as we talk about emotional health, we've talked about how do we know if we're emotionally healthy? How do we know if we're doing good in this area of our life? And I think the answer is simply this. Am I living by the Spirit in such a way that the fruit of the Spirit is coming out of my life? If the fruit of the Spirit is coming out of my life, then you know you're at a good place emotionally. So Galatians 5, what is it, verse 22? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Come on, don't you want to experience more of that in your life? Amen. Come on, doesn't the world need more of that? Yes. Peace, patience, Amen. goodness gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit coming out of your life as you live by the Spirit and let Him lead you in every single area of your life. Live by the Spirit, guys. This is so core and so central for us. And this is how we're going to grow in emotional maturity. So remember, I'm talking about these are, these are practices, that they're, they're habits, but really it's more about what are we centering our life around? How am I living my life? And it's putting Jesus front and center and making him actually the king of my heart. Of every area of my heart, he is the king. He's my leader. And I'm living for him. And it's all about him. And so as I do that, really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm letting the spirit lead me in my life. So can I be angry and not sin? That's the spirit at work in my life when that happens. Can I respond with patience when things don't go my way? When someone eats the last of your favorite snack at home, how do you respond? You fly off the handle? That was yours. Maybe it had your name on it. And they, they finished it off. How dare they? Right? Come on. How do you handle that? Fruit of the spirit or fruit of the flesh? <laughs> Can I go through difficult circumstances in life and still be full of the joy of the Lord? For the fruit of the spirit is love and joy. It is possible to go through anything and still be full of the joy of the Lord because joy is, circum is not circumstantial. It is something that comes out of the life of the Spirit living inside of you. Can I love my co-workers when someone else gets the promotion and I didn't? That's the fruit of the Spirit coming out of my life. I think there's a reason that love is the first one mentioned. Yeah. You know, you, you study Jesus and the teachings of his, Jesus, uh, of, of his life. And, uh, you know, almost everybody on planet Earth is a fan of Jesus' teachings. Yeah. They just don't want to believe that he actually rose from the dead and they make him the Lord of their life. Yeah. But when you look at his teachings, this is what he asked us to do because he knows what will actually truly give us life in this life. It's, that, it's by believing in him and what he did through the cross and making him the Lord, the king of our life. But we love his teachings. Everybody loves his teachings, and you study Jesus' teachings, and he elevates love above everything else. And then you read through the rest of the New Testament as all these followers of Jesus are just learning how to be the church, how to follow Jesus. And you read through all the New Testament, and you see love, love, love. One, it's like love is a theme. And it's so important. Like, if we are going to be emotionally healthy, we have got to be people who love well. And so the third thing that I would encourage you to, to live or practice is loving well. Loving well. Can I just say this? Loving well is the measure of maturity. Our ability to love well or our inability to love well 
is the measure of maturity. It shows us where we're at on that maturity thing. In our prayer time before service today, it was prayed and, and, and declared like Jesus did everything well. And he really loved well above everything else too. And I pray that we would emulate Jesus, the one that we're following, and we would love well. Like if we don't get that right, guys, it is going to impact everything in our life. Can we love well? Huh. You know, we were talking about emotional health, and I, I'm just, I'm saddened and I'm tired of seeing the effects of emotional unhealth in too many people's lives, in too many people's families, in too many jobs, workplaces, all over the place. What we need is followers of Jesus who are emotionally healthy. And that means we need to stand up, stand out, be set apart in how we love people. That's what Jesus said. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. If you love one another. He says that a lot. You notice that like several times in that. Like it's, it's almost like it's, that, it's important that we do this love one another thing. As followers of Christ, we're called to love differently than the world loves. We value that so much here. It's so important. Now, remember what last summer, if you were around last summer, we did a whole series all summer, Love Different. That was the name of the whole series because we're called to love differently. And as we look at the love of believers and the love of non-believers, do we see a difference? Is the love outside the church different than the love inside the church? Are we doing a better job at loving people? If I don't really love people, then am I really a follower of Jesus? If I'm not known by love, Jesus says this is what you'll be known by, am I really his disciple? Because Jesus said clearly, my followers, my disciples will be known by love. If I'm not known by love, am I really a disciple? These are things we, as we read Jesus' teachings, we've got to really take to heart, guys. We, I pray that we would excel in loving people. We would love well. It's interesting that Jesus would say this is a new command because he's already talked about it. It's already recorded uh, several times in the Gospels. Hey, what's the most important commandment, Jesus? And so he doesn't give him one answer. He gives him two answers, right? Love God and love people. It's like it's two, but it's one. They're all, they're connected. Okay, you got to do both. Love God and love people. Because Jesus is basically saying we cannot separate our love for people from our love from God. And then he has a lot of other things like love your enemy. If you can't love people, how can you even say you love God? I mean, there's all this stuff that we see in the word of God about this. But why would he say it's a new command? He's already said this. But Jesus is bringing clarity on how he wants us to live out this command to love one another. That's why I say, hey, new command, here's what I want you to understand. Let me explain this again in a new way so that you really get what I'm saying. And what Jesus does with these words is he simplifies it for us. This is how you're called to, to live life, just love one another. Okay, but also he raises the bar as he does this. You notice this? He simplifies it but he raises the bar because Jesus' new command, it's less complicated, but it's more demanding. Because how are we called to love people? The way he loved us. So he made it less complicated, but it's more demanding. He, he raised the bar. Jesus loved you so much that he gave his life for you. Jesus loved everyone, the world so much that he gave his life. And he says, this is how I want you to love people, the way I've loved them. <laughs> this kind of love is so powerful, guys. It is so anti-kingdom of this world that it will set you and I apart from the world. And it will stand in stark contrast in such a way that two powerful things will take place. If you and I really live this kind of love that Jesus is asking us to live, two things will take place. Number one, it will bring unbelievers to Jesus. Yes. By this, everyone, who? Everyone will know that you're my disciples, is what Jesus said. So unbelievers will come to Jesus by the way that we love. And number two, 
it keeps believers strong and united in the Lord. Love one another. As, as we love one another, there's a unity, there's a strength. You need my love. I need your love. We need to love each other. There's, God wants the, the church to be unified, so much so that after this, Jesus goes into a prayer for unity of his church. And so two powerful things happen as we live this out, guys, and I pray that we would love well. And we would see people for who they really are. They are image bearers of God. They're not objects. They're not people to look down upon. They're not people who have different opinions from you that are lesser than you. They're image bearers of God who you and I are called to love, no matter what. And how we love, sometimes that can obviously bring some boundaries and all that kind of stuff, but we're called to love. And I pray that you and I would excel in this. Hey, what we need more of is healthy followers of Jesus that practice Sabbath and rest, that are practicing the presence of God, and that are loving well. So my question for you as we end here right now is this. I want you to reflect on this. Does my current lifestyle and habits place Jesus at the center of my life? Why don't we stand to our feet right now and let's close our eyes and let's just listen. And ask the Spirit to speak to us. What do we need to do as a result of this message today? What are some habits? What are some things that I need to change? How can I center my life around Jesus? Let him speak to you right now what you need to hear in regards to this message today.